In this lecture, we'll learn how nuclear fusion occurs inside the sun and how the energy from fusion gets out of the sun and reaches us. I'll also go over how we know what's going on inside the sun since it's not exactly a place we've been able to visit. Nuclear fusion is one of my absolute favorite things in astronomy. It is so interesting. In the last lecture, we learned that the sun shines because of the energy generated by fusion that takes place in the very hot, very dense core. The sun is converting hydrogen into helium. It's true alchemy. First, we need to distinguish between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Fission is when a bigger nucleus splits into smaller pieces. Fission is how nuclear power plants on Earth generate energy. We split isotopes of uranium or plutonium in sustained chain reactions. Nuclear fusion is when small nuclei combine to make larger nuclei. This is what's going on in the sun and in other stars. Fusion happens because it's hot in the core. Temperature is motion, so in these very hot conditions, the nuclei are moving around at enormous speeds. The sun is mostly hydrogen or single protons. Two positively charged protons want to repel due to the electromagnetic force. Therefore, in order for the protons to fuse, the collision has to be big. If there's enough energy, they can overcome the repulsion and fuse. Sticking together two protons is not easy, but the strong force can overcome the electromagnetic force once the protons are close enough. The Coulomb barrier is another name for the electromagnetic repulsion between the protons. The hydrogen fusion that happens in the sun consists of four protons transforming into one helium nucleus plus some energy. This is called the proton-proton chain. There are three basic steps. In the first step, two protons fuse to form a nucleus consisting of one proton and one neutron. This is an isotope of hydrogen known as deuterium. In this reaction, a proton is converted into a neutron. The laws of physics say charge must be conserved, so we also get out of the reaction a positively charged particle called a positron. We started with a charge of plus two, and we end up with a charge of plus two. The other particle we get is a neutrino. A neutrino is a subatomic particle with a very tiny mass. Step one occurs twice in the overall chain. In the second step, a deuterium nucleus fuses with a proton, resulting in a nucleus of helium-3. Helium-3 is a rare form of helium with two protons and one neutron. We also get a gamma-ray photon. Again, this step occurs twice in the chain. In the final step, two helium-3 nuclei fuse to form helium-4, which is normal helium. We also get two excess protons, and these two protons can start the chain all over again, fusing to make deuterium. Here is the whole chain showing all of the steps. The overall reaction is four protons, combining to make one helium nucleus. The gamma rays and subatomic particles, the neutrinos and positrons, carry off the energy released in the reactions. Fusion of hydrogen into helium generates energy because a helium nucleus is slightly less massive than the combined mass of the four hydrogen nuclei. When the four hydrogen nuclei fuse into helium, a little of the mass disappears. The disappearing mass becomes energy in accord with Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared. Fusion in the sun converts about 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 million tons of helium every second. That means 4 million tons of matter is turned into energy every second. This sounds like a lot, but it's actually a tiny fraction of the sun's total mass. There's enough hydrogen in there to last another 5 billion years. 
our sun is quite stable. We don't have enormous fluctuations of luminosity, and that's a good thing. The stability comes from a natural feedback process that acts as a thermostat for the sun's interior. If the core temperature rises, the rate of fusion increases. More protons would be colliding with one another with greater energies. This energy would raise the pressure in the core, and the core would expand and cool. This cooling, in turn, would cause the fusion rate to drop back down and the core to contract. The contracting core would then heat up and the fusion rate would be restored to normal. This process repeats. There's one more thing I want to mention. Each fusion reaction is converting four protons into one helium nucleus. Therefore, the total number of particles in the sun's core is decreasing. This gradual reduction in the number of particles causes the core to slowly shrink. This slow shrinkage will gradually increase the core temperature and the fusion rate. Therefore, the sun is getting brighter and hotter, albeit quite slowly. How does the energy from fusion get out of the sun? Well, deep in the sun's interior, the plasma is so dense that a photon can only travel a fraction of a millimeter in any one direction before it interacts with an electron and gets deflected in another direction. The photons zigzag through the sun's interior so much that they take a very long time to make any outward progress. This is called radiative diffusion. Once the photons make it to the top of the radiation zone, they get carried upward by convection in the convection zone. The journey of solar energy from the core to the photosphere takes hundreds of thousands of years. The convection zone is right below the photosphere, and the rising of hot gas and sinking of cool gas gives the photosphere a mottled appearance. This is a close-up of the photosphere. Those bright spots are about a thousand kilometers across. So how do we know what's happening inside the sun? It's not like we've been there for a visit. There are three main ways we study the sun's interior. We can make mathematical models, we can observe solar vibrations, and we can observe solar neutrinos. Our primary way of learning about the interior of the sun and other stars is by creating mathematical models that use the laws of physics to predict internal conditions. A basic model uses the sun's observed composition and mass as input to equations that describe gravitational equilibrium, temperature, and the rate at which energy moves from the core to the photosphere. We can then calculate the sun's temperature, pressure, and density at any depth. We predict the rate of nuclear fusion in the core by combining these calculations with knowledge about nuclear fusion gathered in laboratories on Earth. Another way to learn about the inside of the sun is to observe vibrations on the sun's surface. This is somewhat similar to what geologists do when they study the vibrations that earthquakes cause on Earth. The patterns of vibration on the surface tell us about what the sun is like inside. Light from portions of the surface that are coming towards us are blue shifted, and light from portions that are falling away from us are red shifted. The vibrations are small but measurable. A third way to study the sun's interior is to observe the neutrinos that are created during the proton-proton chain. These subatomic particles rarely interact with matter and therefore can pass through almost anything. Neutrinos produced in the sun's core pass through the solar interior almost as though it were empty space. Therefore, in principle, they give us a way to monitor what is happening inside the core of the sun. Because neutrinos pass through everything, they are difficult for astronomers to detect. Neutrino observatories are placed underground in order to distinguish neutrinos from reactions caused by other particles. The overlying rock blocks most other particles, but the neutrinos can pass right through. The image here is of the underground Super Kamiokande Neutrino Detection Experiment in Japan. Early attempts to detect solar neutrinos were only partially successful, capturing only one-third of the number predicted by models of nuclear fusion in the sun's core. This disagreement between the model predictions and actual observations came to be called the solar neutrino problem. 
For more than 30 years, the solar neutrino problem was one of the great mysteries in astronomy. Either something was wrong with our understanding of fusion in the sun, or some of the sun's neutrinos were somehow escaping detection. We now know that the missing solar neutrinos were going underdetected. It turns out that neutrinos come in three distinct types, and early solar neutrinos could detect only one type. More recent detectors, like the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, shown here, can detect all three neutrino types. The results confirm that the total number of solar neutrinos is equal to what we expect from our models of nuclear fusion in the sun. We've learned that neutrinos change from one type to another on their journey from the sun's core to its surface. That's all for now. I hope the next time you're outside in the sun, you'll get some extra enjoyment knowing about its structure and how it produces energy. I'll talk to you soon.